Hello and welcome to today's session. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items first. Uh, just to let you know, the session is being recorded and will be able to be viewed on demand um, after the event. If you don't wish to participate in a recorded session, disconnect now. By default, you'll be in silent mode, but you can ask questions directly in the Q&A and they'll be posted at the appropriate moment as part of the interactive session. You can also post comments or questions on your preferred social channels, leveraging the hashtag Vertex, that's V-E-R-T-E-X underscore I-I-O-T. So uh, welcome to today's virtual conference, Augmented Reality and 3D Visualization Use Cases in Manufacturing, brought to you by IIoT World and sponsored by Vertex. I'm Jeff Wheelwright, your host for today. And on behalf of the whole IIoT World team, our sponsor speaker Vertex and our panel guests, we thank you for joining us. We'll monitor our uh, online social channels, so feel free to send in your questions in the Q&A section or via our social channels with that hashtag again, vertex underscore IIoT. We have many people registered for the event today, representing a broad global community, and we're excited to have you here and look forward to a fantastic discussion. As I mentioned, the session's being recorded and will be available to view on demand. So with that, I'd like to welcome our guests and wish our audience a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you all again for joining us. Today, we have a subject that is of strong interest to manufacturing companies, augmented reality and 3D visualization use cases in manufacturing. With me today are two guests who can shed some light on this hot topic. Our panelists are Christine Peary, founder of the Augmented Reality for Enterprise Alliance, AREA, and one of the world's leading experts in how enterprises are using AR. She's joined by Matt Hein, VP of Product at Vertex Software, a 3D cloud-native visualization platform that allows manufacturing companies to build and deploy real-time, highly performant, scalable 3D digital twin apps. I'm really excited to talk to you both today. And I have to note that I've been privileged to see um, Christine in action over the past several years as I've done what I could to help out on various area committees in my work with AR pioneer Ethier. And Matt and I have talked last week in advance of our session today, and he has some great insights I think will complement the work that Christine has done really well. So welcome to you both. And I'd like to kick off the session today by introducing Christine. She's an industry analyst, researcher, and an advocate for interoperable augmented reality. From 2009 to 2016, she led the grassroots community dedicated to this purpose. She's on numerous boards, is a member of many standards groups, and co-chairs the IEEE uh, Standards uh, Association, RLM, a working group, and the OGC Geopose SWG. She's the founder of the AR for Enterprise Alliance, chairs the research committee, and leads the area interoperability and standards program. And that's only part of the story. So take it away, Christine. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm uh, really excited. And I think that the intersection of AR and manufacturing is um, very, very fruitful, very productive uh, area. So first, let me introduce you to the, the industry association um, from which, uh, from, of which we speak. Can you go to the next slide, please? So we believe that the ecosystem of enterprise augmented reality stakeholders includes three major groups. The enterprises, and those are really the driving force, they have to be at the, uh, the top of the pyramid, if we will, because it's their needs, their requirements, their um, uh, return on investment that drives uh, the providers that uh, nourishes them as they are developing and offering AR-enabled software, hardware, variety of technologies. So we, we tend to group many, many different kinds of providers into that one uh, circle in the lower left. And then we have also a variety of non-commercial entities. Interestingly, we have universities, research institutes, um, city, municipal, uh, national governments, we have um, standards bodies, and these are all doing their part as well to develop new technologies and push the boundaries either on the technical side or in the social, ethical, um, and, and other research aspects. 
So together, these three categories of stakeholders are really what we, we think of as the AR ecosystem. And the next slide will show you how the area supports them. We first, um, on the left side, we, we prepare and publish a lot of thought leadership content. That's on our website, we have podcasts, we have webcasts, webinars. Um, we also have a blog and a newsletter, of course, social media. But the main thing that was so important here is that it's really coming from the experts themselves, the people who are in the trenches and who are developing and using these technologies on a regular basis within the area members as well as with the community at large we support um, the establishment of better better networks better uh, community by uh, establishing events uh, we have um, uh, discussion groups and so forth that help us to help those who are very experienced share with uh, others who are perhaps less so it's a, it's a different kind of thought leadership it's really more intimate and then the third uh, pillar of our strategy is to support the education of new professionals who are coming into the fields of enterprise augmented reality and may not have all the skills. In fact, we know there's a real shortage of people in this domain. And so we want to promote all kinds of programs that will close that skills gap. And then finally, uh, we have a number of committees that are designed and, and targeted at reducing barriers to adoption. So I chair the research committee, as Jeff mentioned, we also have a security um, safety committee and, and some others that I, I won't go into in any detail, but we, we, they're there to focus on specific barriers. Next slide, please. So I, given the opportunity, I'd be happy to discuss a little bit further uh, which industries and geographies are taking this up um, the most. I also can explain to you why these industries, these verticals and geographies, and we, ha we have seen some trends there. I think if we're going to have a discussion about adoption, we have to think about where's the revenue coming from and where's the return on investment. So this is, comes down to the um, serious issues of money and business models. And then the third big pillar, just like the committees on the far right hand side, is what are the adoption challenges for manufacturing? And we did a report, we did a study, an in-depth study on this um, a couple of years ago, and I'd be happy to share the outcomes and the, the, the insights that that study uh, uh, revealed for our members. It's not public. There is a executive summary of that study of that research that is available on the area website that's the area.org uh, but i can share the the highlights and discuss the 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 technical the, the obstacles we found and really uh, the word there the reason i didn't say technical is because they're mostly non-technical barriers the two major barriers to ar adoption um, in manufacturing are not technical. Okay, Jeff, that's what I wanted to share as far as my prepared remarks. And if you want, I can get into these, uh, these other topics when we get into the Q&A. Fantastic, thanks so much, Christine. I know that people will have a lot of questions for you. And I would remind everyone to use the chat window to ask your questions and we'll get to them uh, after some initial thoughts from our second panelist, uh, Matt. Um, and we, we've had a question about uh, the video of this webinar being available um, afterwards, and yes, it will. Uh, and I will repeat that at the end, just in case anyone misses it. So Matt is not only the VP of product at Vertex Software, but he also oversees the creation and implementation of initiatives on new markets and products. His goal is to ensure new product capabilities match customer expectations and needs. Matt uh, received his bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering from Iowa State, and did his grad work at the Virtual Reality uh, Application Center, uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, Office of Naval Research and DARPA. So really interesting background um, and uh, very much looking forward to uh, um, hearing what uh, insights you have to offer, uh, Matt. And uh, at this point, I will uh, turn it over to you. It's all yours. Thanks, Jeff. 
Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, so, you know, like Jeff was saying, I've, I've been in this uh, visualization AR VR community for, for a long time now. And, um, you know, going back to early 2000s, there was a lot of hype about uh, VR and AR then. And it seems like we're, we're approaching another, um, you know, cycle of that. And so one, one thing that um, we're doing at Vertex um, when it comes to AR and VR plus, you know, the IoT is really, um, we're seeing a convergence of these technologies to really um, uh, get digital twins um, out into um, the right employees' hands and the right customers' hands so that they can make um, intelligent decisions. And so that's kind of where we see the um, the intersection of these two things. Um, so uh, my company Vertex helps do some of these uh, visualization capabilities. But one thing I wanted to start off with is just talk about, you know, why, why would you want to visualize um, IOT and specifically, you know, a 3D digital twin. Um, I think it's useful to talk about um, uh, data visualization. So um, here's some data that's probably relevant to um, everyone in the world right now. Um, this is the number, um, this is the data from uh, the CDC on the number of vaccinations um, within the United States. So if I were to give you a table of data like this, um, you know, there's only so many things that you could probably um, ascertain from this. And you could probably do a sort and filter and things like that. But, you know, if, if I presented the same data um, in a graph form, you know, that's going to tell you um, something more meaningful. And in this case, uh, you know, time series chart of um, vaccine doses administered. But now if you take that same data and then again, you know, it's that data is state by state. So if I were to actually overlay that on a map of the United States, this is gonna tell you something way more different that that chart and table couldn't necessarily tell you. Um, you know, from, from this, um, I would say that, you know, um, the South is not doing as well as let's say the, um, the Rocky Mountain upper Midwest. Um, and so, you know, I, IOT data paired with visualization to create you know, data visual twins, um, both factory and product, that's kind of an area that um, is of interest to uh, me and Vertex. So, you know, and again, if I were to look at the IoT data coming in, um, you know, I could make some guesses with this data here. I could visualize this data. Maybe this, this is a wind turbine data um, from Texas last month and you know, power output dropped um, because things froze up, right? Um, or, you know, I could, and this is um, an example that we built, take that same IoT data, create a representative 3D asset directly from the engineering configuration of that, and then couple that with those IoT data sets, and you can do some pretty interesting things. Um, you know, this, this will help tell a field service worker, you know, make that IoT data useful. We've also done this um, in factory floors. And one, th one thing that was interesting that Christine mentioned about that um, adoption of uh, AR and other um, technologies, I, I would just say, you know, even let's throw in AI and some other things, uh, you know, it's not always a technological um, barrier. And oftentimes I think she's right. Um, a lot of it's culture and it's a lot of understanding like what's the appropriate uh, use case for this technology. Um, one thing that's interesting in terms of what, what I'm seeing with AR, with um, the customers that I talk to, um, you know, they, they want to get this um, 3D data downstream to a set of um, glasses, but they can't even get that data to the manufacturing floor. They can't even get that into a salesperson's hands um, or someone in field service. They, they can't even get just 3D on um, a mobile device or, or a laptop. And so really a lot of the technological challenges that I have 
I come across are, you know, step one, how do I get this data even into a form that I could render, let's say in augmented reality. Um, some of the challenges that we just, we, we see there's a lot of translation of that data. And then, you know, the more steps you kind of um, jump through, the more disconnected you are from, you know, the, the actual source of truth of that data. And that's very important if, um, you know, from an AR digital twin standpoint that you're connected to um, the PLM system or wherever that source of truth is. And so we just see a lot of uh, jumping through hoops to get there. Um, so one thing that um, Vertex has been doing is helping companies, um, you know, connect their PLM system to our cloud visualization API. That way, you know, we can power uh, digital twin applications for AR and VR. And so we, we see a lot of um, very emergent use cases coming from all sorts of places. And the most interesting ones are outside of engineering. So, you know, with customers, with um, people on the shop floor, with field service technicians. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Matt. Hang on a sec. Yeah, so um, it looks like you and Christine are seeing many of the same issues cropping up as you talk to manufacturing companies about this. Um, so I I'm um, gonna uh, start with uh, uh, repeating that we will have uh, the the recording of this uh, available afterwards. Um, so anybody who wants to, to see it, uh, you'll get uh, the, the link to that. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we are gonna have an active participants prize. So a one year membership to our VIP community um, for uh, anyone who, um, well, to, you can enter into the random drawing by engaging with the speakers and posting questions in the Q&A section. So just a, a little further incentive. Um, so first question um, I have is from uh, Mohammed, who asks, Matt, um, how's your 3D different from other 3D CAD software? Uh, is it yeah. running real-time analysis on data from physical assets? Yeah, so the, the big difference, um, you know, one of the challenges that we've um, seen, my, the co-founder of, well, the founder of Vertex, he um, was at a company called EAI back in the 90s that eventually became um, part of uh, Team Center and which is now part of Siemens now. And, you know, one of the challenges that he saw was, um, you know, in order to do visualization applications, you need to have a really beefy graphics card and, and computer. Um, you need an expensive piece of software. Um, and now, you know, with AR, you know, we're talking about expensive hardware. Um, and, you know, oftentimes the visualization um, uh, tools, especially that originate in engineering, are not really user friendly enough for, let's say, someone um, in field, uh, you know, a field technician. And so <clears throat> what a lot of the vendors are trying to do is use something like WebGL, which um, is a web based visualization, but you're still streaming all of the data to that client um, GPU. What Vertex is doing is we figured out a way to um, render data in the cloud first and then just stream the pixels back to the device. And so, you know, um, you know, thinking through the HoloLens and some of those other things, you usually see like, well, I'm tethered to some device. We're really trying to untether you and have, you know, um, we've been able to render airplanes on a Raspberry Pi device. And so that's that's kind of the thing that we're we're, we're trying to do with, with our technology. Yeah. Yeah. And I now have a question for Christine. Um, you talked about um, barriers to adoption um, and you, you kind of gave some tantalizing hints about that. So maybe you could just, just give us a, a couple of your key kind of major um, barriers to adoption that you're seeing for um, uh, adoption of uh, AR and manufacturing. Yeah. So the word that Matt used was spot on. Um, the first one that we saw is cultural. Uh, you know, many um, organizations don't have AR as part of their vision. They are thinking about automation. They're thinking about ways to reduce the reliance on humans. And augmented reality is the opposite of that. It's actually enabling 
people in the workplace to do things better. And it's not, so that's, that's a culture, that's really a divide that, um, that we saw. And so there's some education that needs to happen there at the management level, and not just the senior management level, even a mid-level management. Um, and then there's the, the second really big um, gotcha or just barrier is related to this, it's the workers themselves. Um, they're very sensitive about things that might uh, threaten their, their, their role. And they haven't yet understood that AR is about strengthening their role, not weakening it, not taking decisions out of their hands, but on the contrary, giving people more information with which to make decisions in the workplace. So that's, those, those two um, came out as, as really important to the success of AR adoption. That, that we work on those. And you know, there are legal barriers as well, because it, in any workplace, whether it's manufacturing or field service or anywhere else, we do have to be sensitive to um, you know, who's being captured, what kind of personal data is, is shared and so forth, captured and shared. So there are, there's, there are technical uh, approaches to these, um, the, these, common barriers that are across all industries that are looking at AR. Um, but we, we, we know that in manufacturing, um, you know, there's, there are uh, worker rights and, and concerns there. I think on the technical side, the real value of augmented reality gets met or get, we begin to achieve a return on investment when um, there's a back-end integration. If it's just going to be to deliver step-by-step -step instructions, you can make a, a you know a return investment uh, calculation on only that use case. However, you know let's let's be frank. The more use cases that you have, the higher the return investment will be for a fixed cost uh, back-end and in, uh, infrastructure and. The, the upfront uh, device. So the more use cases that we have that are around, for example, uh, I'm writing up, I'm working on a project now that's around uh, supply chain. So it's the manufacturing supply chain, keeping track of where the raw materials are, when do I need them, and making sure that the person who gets a particular work order knows where to go to get the parts or the equipment that they need, their tools or, or the, the raw materials. Those are some examples. Yeah, and I think those are good examples. They also are kind of aligned with a lot of what I've seen working with Athir is that um, there's a really big issue uh, to be addressed around change management. So that everybody, um, whether it's the suppliers or the people on the shop floor or, or the people who are adopting the technology, um, understand exactly what is being achieved and why and how. So um, uh, how are you seeing it, Matt? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one, one good example, and, you know, it's, it's all in the word augmented, right? Um, so you are augmenting that, that human and um, and one thing I, how I explain this uh, AI and um, augmented reality to my mom uh, is, you know, the best chess player in the world can be beaten by a computer, but uh, a human plus a computer can beat a computer, right? Because there's like some of that, the, the creativity um, and the things that computers can't do right now, um, you can do. And so, you know, being able to bring these technologies in and, you know, I think it's very important that, um, you know, the, you know, the rollout, yeah, there, there is this broad vision where we could roll this out across the entire enterprise. But one, one thing that, you know, I've seen quite a bit is, okay, let's start small on a very specific use case where we know um, that we can prototype out the solution and do a pilot and prove the ROI and really get in, you know, um, one project that I'm thinking about, it was, you know, augmenting someone on the shop floor, 
you know, if, if the shop floor thinks that there's anything in their, in their way, uh, you know, technology wise of doing their job, it's not going to get adopted. And so it's very important to get um, that user buy-in um, before you start, roll, um, you know, scaling it out, making sure that you're collecting that user feedback and iterating um, on the user experience of, um, you know, whatever application it is. Um, I've, I've just seen that time and time again, you know, you can fail, you know, without getting that um, end, end customer buy-in for those um, solutions. Yeah, and uh, we're getting lots of questions now. Um, so I'm just going to jump in and also uh, thank Danny for the, uh, the previous question. Um, and uh, we have a uh, question from Tim, and th this is interesting. Um, can you describe what a typical team looks like and what rough skill sets involved with designing the AR experience? Designing for AR is different uh, from the web or other platforms. So uh, do you want to start with that one, Christine? Well, I, I can, I can uh, start, as you said. So one of the things that I found uh, very, very valuable is the team has to have um, business component, uh, user experience software, not just the execution of the, of the authoring, but the design of user interaction. And with the web, if you remember 20 years ago, there was a lot of experimentation in those early days before we got to something that people feel comfortable with today. And the same thing's happening in augmented reality. We're nowhere uh, near the level of maturity that we are with the web. So there's a lot of experimentation about the, the mixture of things like gestures, speech as uh, commands, because very often if the person has both hands uh, uh, busy, and they're, they're wearing a, a device, they can't enter uh, text in a keyboard. They need to have um, some other ways of interacting with the information and requesting information or having prompts. So um, there's a lot around that human factors and the design of these input methods. You would think that this would be farther along than it is, than it, it's not. It's just, there's, there's still a very, high amount of experimentation. And one of the reasons because some use cases require the user to be um, interacting with 3D information. And that information may not have those models, for example, may not have handles on them. They may not have um, the ability to rotate them to see uh, or to open a model and to see the complexity. So. That's where companies like, like Vertex and, and others come in because the models themselves are intelligent. And that's a, a, a one of the keys that you need is somebody else who's really good at, at using models. Now, in part, they use them to deliver information, but there's another role for 3D models in augmented reality, and that is to recognize the 3D world. And so if we can have uh, systems experts in 3D model for scanning the world, for segmenting the, the, the point clouds and understanding. So creating an ontology that's specific to that company and those tasks that the worker is using. So right there is another skill, ontologies, uh, the hierarchical um, uh, in structure for labels, uh, and linking information in a logical way is an expertise. It's, it's truly a talent, it's a skill. Um, and then of course, using the tools themselves. I think a lot of people are turning to Unity first for a prototyping tool. And so, and while many people do know how to use Unity because they're in the gaming business, manufacturing isn't quite the same thing as building a game. And secondly, Unity is good for prototyping, but I believe that in order to roll out some uh, company-wide platforms, you need systems that are web-based and you need systems that don't require the user to change applications when they wanna change tasks. So th those are some, some of my ideas. Thanks, Christine. And, and what do you uh, look for, Matt, in terms of the skill set for the team? Yeah, um, 
you know, if I, if I look at um, some of the customers that we've worked up, um, work, work with, um, you know, the complexion of that team varies, but I think, you know, depending on the use case, but, you know, definitely having um, someone from the business side there to make sure that, you know, you're solving a real world use case, um, that there's real business value behind it, I think is very important. Um, and Christine's right, um, you know, my graduate work was in a field of human computer interaction, which um, was kind of the evolution of, I think, human factors, right? But, you know, it was, it was interesting. Um, you, you really wanna uh, make sure that you get a user experience designer that um, isn't just graphics based. Um, you know, there's, if, if I look at um, user experience design over the last 20 years or so, you know, you, you started going from a desktop application to a web application. So that was kind of a paradigm shift um, in some ways. Then, you know, mobile came along and everyone had to, you know, rethink how am I going to do these gestures on mobile? Um, you know, I think you're going to see the same, you're basically seeing the same thing with um, AR and, and VR, um, you know, because there's, you know, some, some of those, you know, like a, a button, like does a button translate um, the right way into um, an AR use case. You know, it, it really depends. And I think that's where getting someone that's had um, maybe some experience doing game design, because there's a lot of things that um, carry over from that world. And so, uh, you know, I would, you know, if I was building an AR team, I'd definitely try to find a user experience designer that's had some game development background. Um, and like Christine said, you know, the the, the, the people that you can just get out of the box right now to help build AR apps are, are mostly coming from um, the game development world or, you know, from, you know, companies like uh, Vertex or the PLM industry, you know, those are where you're going to find the, um, the, the best developers for this. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad we brought this up because one thing that um, Vertex from the beginning, you know, one, one thing that we see is we get a lot of web developers saying, um, I want to, um, I'm being asked by my company to build this thing. I don't know anything about 3D graphics. Like I don't even, you know, understand how to get the data in, the data formats, um, you know, what's a quaternion, um, which is, you know, uh, you know, something that we use quite a bit in computer graphics for camera models and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think that the industry is evolving to the point where you don't need to be an expert in a lot of these things in order to build AR applications, but I think we're still a few years out from that. So, you know, if, if you want to get um, going on a project today, I would definitely look for some backgrounds um, in game development and um, don't skimp on a user experience designer. That's going to be the key to a successful project. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like good advice. We got another question now from Brett, uh, and this is an interesting one, and the one that I've definitely heard from a lot of customers uh, over the past few years. How do you future-proof an AR integration? Hardware and software are progressing so fast. Is it better to develop in-house or work with a third party? And, and you know, I've heard this kind of work being described as trying to nail jelly to a wall, you know, because you've got stuff that's uh, evolving and changing uh, all the time, um, but. Uh, you know, where I've seen it work best is people, if people have a really clear understanding of what each piece of the puzzle is going to do uh, and how you can design it um, so that when you can, when you swap in, you know, whether it's a different device, say pair of glasses, or you're now supporting um, iOS uh, where you were only supporting Android before, um, or you're gonna support 3D models where you only had 2D before, um, that, that you kind of got a plan for that. And I think it comes back to that, uh, that change management. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, what would your thoughts be on that, uh, Christine? Well, it's a tough one. It really is. And I, my, my uh, sympathies, <laughs> we've done some research within the area on this subject about future proofing. Um, one thing is for sure um, that you're going to have to integrate with the back end. And there are tools that are going to support you um, across operating systems. The data itself, um, integrating, making sure that the data sets 
that you have are working um, in identifying users, their particular skills, their, their training uh, certifications, um, their location. These are things that can be done without augmented reality. So making sure that your backend is context aware as a general rule is going to be, um, is gonna pay off. So what is context? Of course, it's the environment. It's also uh, the, the history of that particular person or that machine, um, that place. If you've been sent out to, to, to uh, you know, repair a, a piece of equipment that's down in, in a manufacturing context, you need to know that it's the parts for this were ordered already and where they are and so forth. So there's a lot of intelligence that if we don't have that intelligence before we add a display either in their hands or on their face, it's not gonna be very valuable. I think another thing in terms of future-proofing is standards. Let me repeat that. Standards will help you. Um, they are your friend to the future because standards create a baseline of interoperability. And that really is valuable to customers who don't want to be locked in to one vendor. And there is a, a strong uh, pattern when a technology is emerging, not just augmented reality, to create a technology silo in which the vendor can control many parts of the stack. But we're getting to a point now with the maturity of augmented reality and the maturity of industry 4.0 industrial IoT that there are protocols and encoding standards that can be used. And with augmented reality as well, we're getting to the point where we can see integration of uh, manufacturing standards into those systems. So ask your vendors before making any purchases if they support the specifications that you know your manufacturing systems use. Uh, that sounds like good advice. And Matt, your thoughts on uh, future proofing? Yeah, um, those were all good points, Christine. One, one, um, if I put on my software architect hat here, you know, one thing that I would probably make sure that you do is focus um, not on the hardware or on that client device. So, you know, back end or the actual headset and really focus on the um, data and the data workflow and you know, try to decouple that as much as possible from any specific vendor, including Vertex um, or any hardware device. Um, you know, this is kind of the wild west of AR devices. Um, you know, new things come are coming out. You know, every three months, and you know, I do think that there's been some um, attempts to create some uh, standards and things like that. You know, I would go back to. Um, data standards, like what what is the the data coming out of the um, system, um, either IoT or the PLM data, MES, whatever it is, and you know focus on making sure that your um, you know APIs are the right way internally, and you know thinking about you know how am I going to use a data lake or data warehouse um, with this data, because then once once you figure that out, you know. Honestly, the, the other stuff is um, is kind of downhill from my perspective. And you know, when, once we get into a client and start talking them through their project, they're like, uh, "Yeah, maybe you should come back in six months because we've got this data mess right now, and we, you know, we're not even ready for this right now." So, you know, I would, you know, make sure that you spend a lot of time thinking through, you know, data hygiene and you know APIs internally, and then you know. Hopefully those those APIs, like Christine said, you know, become standards after a while that will help you avoid vendor lock-in. So you can, if you don't like Vertex, you swap Vertex out for something else. So, but it's my job to make sure you don't swap out. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I, I, I like uh, your um, um, thoughts about cleaning up. It kind of reminds me of uh, 
uh, remodeling, because uh, uh, I've been through that recently. I understand that, that you're in the middle of it as well. That whole thing of you really got to clean things up first uh, before you start any kind of remodeling project. Uh, and I think that that's, that's definitely yep. true in this context take, as well. Take it down to the studs first, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So uh, a question for you, Matt, uh, this is from Ernest, who asks, um, how are the algorithms of your system sensitive to scattered data for visual, visual uh, more coffee, um, to scattered data for visualization, especially in terms of step-by-step uh, -step changes, uh, as Christina said? Yeah, so um, uh, thanks for the question, Ernest. So, um, you know, again, I, I see two kind of classes of technology for visualization out there right now. You're either doing asset streaming um, or you're doing pixel streaming. So asset streaming would be actually taking um, the model and that, that could be an engineering model, it could be an architectural model, it just could be abstract information. But you're actually sending that data to every client device that wants to render it. Um, so, in, in that regard, you know, one thing that comes up, you know, I, I spend half my time on customer calls talking to security teams about, okay, this is the most sensitive data in our company. Um, and you're telling me you want to put this in the cloud. And so that's, um, you know, and so, you know, we have these conversations with the security people, but once they understand like, okay, you know, otherwise you're sending that data um, locally to someone's, um, you know, headset or mobile phone, you know, somewhere in the world, you know, how do you know that they're not taking that data off that device? And so that's kind of where, um, as far as, you know, a side benefit of the way that we're doing our rendering, where we're just streaming the pixels and not the assets, is that that data stays in one spot. And, you know, we um, provide you a full audit log from this um, IT security perspective of who's transacted that data, but there's all the data coming back to the clients, just a JPEG for us. And so, you know, with that, um, yeah, there's some things that are sensitive with the JPEG, but they're not getting your intellectual property. And I think that's, that's um, a big challenge, especially if you want high fidelity models um, from engineering and, and um, AR type experiences. Yeah, and that gets to a couple of things, and I'm gonna throw this to you, Christine, in just a sec here, um, in terms of questions we've had from other people. Uh, Declan asks, do companies find it difficult to overcome the barrier of creating AR content, i.e. digital twins? If a number of digital twins of different machinery are required for maintenance, surely this will take a long time to develop. Um, he asks if there's a public library of this type of holographic image. Um, and then uh, we also have um, Jonathan who says, that access to CMS, CMS media content can guarantee that digital uh, designs stay current. Is this part of your software structure and philosophy? Um, so I think there's something in there for, for both of you. Um, and uh, Christine, I'll start with you just in terms of the perceived challenge. Uh, and I think you alluded to it in your deck, Matt, um, of complex, uh, uh, rendering of 3D images and, and um, how do you deal with the resources required for that? Right. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a 3D engineer, um, but uh, here's what, I, what I've seen is that the, the, the role of creating the 3D asset and providing the 3D asset to the customer that's going to use it maybe uh, transitioning from uh, my company who operates a manufacturing plant or you know, factory needing to create the 3D models to my company purchased these uh, expensive machines from a supplier and that supplier provided with the machine a perfect 3D model of that, that instrument, that, that, uh, and all of its parts. And that way, the provider of the technology itself, the physical manifestation of, of, of that component, keeps control of the models. 
and they actually are supplying the models along with the physical artifact. So I think that, that's, that's something that I'm beginning to see. It's an extension of what we saw. People started shipping um, very high-end equipment for manufacturing with a remote assistant. So you could, using the interface of the device itself, call the company that provides you that machine for assistance if it if you if you needed it so i think there's a number of things there that we can we can look at and um and improve upon in the future in terms of 3d models but the the content probably belongs with the company that made the the product or the machine i'm thinking back to one of the earliest examples i know of this has been a good 10 years the u.s government required that every vehicle and ship that it ordered had to be delivered with its digital twin and that transformed the naval engineering business and made it a 3d computer graphics company or business instead of just uh, soldering and and uh, you know welding. Yeah, I, I you know you talk about digital twins and you talk about AR and remote assistance, and I always always think about Apollo thirteen as like the first example of that, where engineers on the ground had to take all of the pieces, all of the physical exactly. pieces that the astronauts had in place to be able to solve an issue, um, and, and they recreated it and then had to communicate that had to provide that kind of remote assistance. So anyway, that's a little off topic, but one of my favorite stories. So I'm gonna throw this to you, Matt, and then uh, we're, we're gonna need to wrap up because we're, we're yeah, yeah. out of time here. Yeah, um, you know, it, it is interesting. Like if, if I'm talking to, let's say a company that manufactures airplanes, um, you know, they sell an airplane um, to an airline and that airline also then leases like a G or Rolls Royce engine, right? Um, but in that airline is, is, you know, they have their service people that, you know, could benefit from augmented reality. So how do you, um, one, you know, a company like Boeing needs like, um, and, I, and I know Airbus does this too, but, you know, they'll save off the tail number configuration for the thing that they, that they sell. Um, to that company, so they'll have you know the configuration um, of the as built. Now the big topic in digital twins, especially in service and um, MRO, is you know how do I keep up with the the as is like that you know mm -hmm. as maintained version. And so I think you know that's that's been a challenge. And you know they um, let's say Boeing and Airbus don't always know know that all the time. Um, it's just you know it depends on their um, what their customers are willing to share with them. And so I, I do think it's a challenge where, um, you know, it, it's tough for you as the owner and operator of a piece of equipment to be able to um, get a digital twin from those companies. I think there's, there's some uh, technology issues, there's some IP issues, there's um, all kinds of um, issues that, that need to be solved there. But I, one, one interesting thing though is, you know, there's, a lot of companies that are um, selling their products as a service now. And just, just like I was saying with, you know, the engines, um, you know, instead of selling you um, a bunch of school buses, maybe I sell you school buses as a service. And, you know, I have a SLA on the number of kids that get delivered to school on time, things like that. And so, you know, it's up to me as the, um, uh, you know, if I'm Navistar or whoever that's selling those school buses, you know, it's up to me to make sure that that school bus is up and running. So if I'm getting some IoT data in saying, hey, you know, there's a future um, repair issue here based on our, our data, send it to this nearest service center, you know, how, you know, you as Navistar now have to arm um, that field service person with the right repair manuals. So maybe, maybe you're more um, able to share a digital twin with, with someone like that um, in that case. And then real, real quick on the CMS thing. Um, yeah, making sure that designs stay current and also the design, like I was saying that let's, let's say I built this F35 um, on March 15th and it had this specific version in here, but the next one might be different based on parts and lot, 
um, you know, my supply chain. So all of that is kept track inside of these PLM and MES systems. And so I think, you know, as far as building digital twins, the best thing to do is stay connected to um, those systems so that your designs stay current. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Christine. Yep. I'm afraid we're, uh, we're out of time here, but I want to thank everyone for taking part in today's session. Visit our events page for upcoming educational webcasts brought to you by IIoT World, and you'll find additional information at IIoT-world.com. Uh, special thanks to our sponsor, Vertex, for this session, and our speakers, uh, Christine and Matt. Um, if you have any suggestions for a topic, we're always welcome feedback, so please drop, a, drop us a message and let us know. Thank you again. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, Thank you, Matt. You. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.